So, uh, if you're a citizen of the internet, which I'm going to imagine you all are, uh, if you're watching this, then you've probably heard of Vaporwave. Uh, it's weird stuff. It's neat stuff. Uh, some people think that it's kind of stupid, but I like it. It's postmodern music that is applying postmodern methods often to things that were in and of themselves postmodern. Uh, it's a nearly comical step towards like a music diversification. And this gets even weirder when you consider that there are subsections of like even that, like there are branches of vaporwave that are distinct from other kinds of vaporwave and chronicling this whole thing is Oh, it's quite the headache. It's made even more complex given the technological angle, uh, given, you know, we're in a space now where something like this is possible. We're capable of making postmodern music in a way that we never would have been able to before, but also there's a method of distribution, which is managed by the creators themselves. And there's an audience for it. We're talking about a true, Marxist state of affairs here. The workers own the means of hacking production, but also confusing. And that's mostly where we need to go from here because the diversification of music has taken this course so deep uh, that one might even not know where this shit began. It's as if it's diversified to an extent that it's like nearly impossible to even categorize? Is postmodern even like the right label to use anymore? Are we past even that? What the hell do we even call this phenomenon? Matter of fact, to what extent they even realize this is like what they're doing is a question that, well, it doesn't really matter because they're already doing it. But while the majority of the musical audience isn't on board with the Vaporwave vibe, uh, the vast majority of the internet audience has probably experienced this phenomenon in a way that seems completely unexpected. It is unexpected. It's a downright profound experience if you're actively looking for it. I'm talking about the first time you heard Bustin'. Explaining why Bustin' is funny is probably the worst crime that one can commit on the internet, and trust me, people have explained it to me. So the last thing that I wanna do here is tell you what you already know about Bustin'. But it's not a stretch really to imagine that you have looked into the person that created Bustin, Neil Ciceriga, and have likely seen that he's produced three full length albums of mashups and remixes of popular music for the purposes of comedy and that these albums are fairly beloved. Actually, I'd assume if you clicked on this video, then you've probably heard of them because that's kind of like the whole reason anyone would, would be here. Just like with Bustin, you already know that they're great and magical experiences of sound, but they're not just funny. And that's the key here. I mean, don't get me wrong, like they're, really funny and the value of them as like things that are very funny cannot be understated. Literally, if you show this to anyone on the planet, they will laugh. It's doing purely what comedy does most successfully. It's a connection between two unexpected things and showing them to you with impact. But like, if you analyze that sentence that I've just spoken, you'll find that there's something universally true to it that exists outside the realm of comedy. Neil Ciceriga. Ciceriga's music is making a connection between two seemingly unrelated things and showing them to you with impact. It's a complicated thing in our cultural landscape. And even though that doesn't entirely matter, it also matters a great deal to our perception of like even what music is now. Going back to what I was saying about Vaporwave, we're seeing music diversify in ways that we couldn't possibly imagine 10 years ago. We are no longer following the natural progression of things. Like some would argue 
even that maybe we're falling down the postmodern rabbit hole of being ironic about things that were ironic 10 years ago and so on and so on. But even to the point that we're using music to comment on music and that music is inadvertently or intentionally commenting on our nostalgia and nostalgia culture is just culture now and oh god, when will we put out the fire of meta narrative? But then you hear this. And suddenly something feels different. Like, it's really funny. It's funny like when someone tells you a joke when you needed it like the most. It's almost relief laughter because it truly is purely funny. Because while the connections that we're making with more diversified versions of arts begin to isolate us into corners of, well, if you haven't heard this, then you'll never get something like this. Uh, here comes this that says, hey, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if Vanessa Carlton and ACDC we're actually kind of making the same song. There lies the unification because we learned something very distinct about music in that very idea. ACDC and Vanessa Carlton were essentially doing something similar musically, or at least we can put those things into the same constraints. The people that like to divide us by genre and say, you know, I hate pop music or I hate ACDC and this kind of music is better than this or this is more complicated, you know, all the bullshit elitism that exists. In that one moment where the two come together perfectly, that conversation is just totally destroyed. We're not so different after all. The diversification of music has been that insofar as talking about our taste has become a conversation, not just like if you like uh, metal music, but which kind of metal music do you like? But when we get down to it, we're talking about these things to the extent of their details, but on the whole, in a world of constant diversification, we're all brought together under the umbrella of actually, we're all kind of the same, aren't we? But then the radical possibilities of this idea are taken even further with tracks like Shit, where it's literally just a nuclear bomb of culture. It's taking all this stuff and actually creating a totally new experience with them. And in essence, this is what Vaporwave often does. So the commonalities with Neil and that subgenre are fairly articulate, but it's also just doing it which is my point. Like, it's recontextualizing music to mean something else. It's inadvertently commenting on its own ability to navigate culture while also navigating culture in an interesting way. And, oh God, I've gone cross-eyed. But the experience of actually listening to it is transcendent. I mean, I would probably never choose to listen to Smash Mouth in my day to day, I must admit. Uh, but when Neil samples Smash Mouth, it makes me see music differently. For instance, in the mashup of Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger and Walking on the Sun, yes, I know, there's immediately a laugh when Smash Mouth comes in. It's like a wave of the 90s just smacking you in the face and blending that with something that somehow still hasn't gotten old, Daft Punk. But the next two feelings are the crux of the experience because next up, we start to sit with Smash Mouth and Daft Punk and it's actually kind of great. Like not only does it work as a mashup, but it's legitimately stepping outside of the, like itself and making a new song called a song I would actually enjoy listening to. Uh, but then you start to listen to the lyrics. I mean, you actually listen to what Smash Mouth is saying and you hear this verse. It ain't no joke, and suddenly you're like, holy shit, are you hearing what Smash Mouth is saying right now? And then you say, holy shit, am I actually listening to Smash Mouth? And I don't mean listening to Smash Mouth in like a passive way when you hear All Star on the radio and you sing the words and you know, you don't turn it off, but you're acting on your base level memory of the song and I don't know, you aren't actually hearing the words being said. I mean, you're listening to Smash Mouth actively. You're hearing what they have to say. And this is not a meme anymore. This is a radical moment of newfound understanding. And somehow this is even funnier. 
I mean, it's not laugh out loud funny, like placing, you know, the emotional eloquence of Vanessa Carlton's piano playing with ACDC's grimy song about being a badass or like swapping the words of, you know, Ghostbusters theme song around to make it sound like Ray Parker Jr. is actually kind of a pervert. This is funny in a way that makes you feel like an asshole. Like you never cared about what Smash Mouth stood for. You just treated him as a joke. And then Neil Ciceriga. By making that very joke highlights how they actually kind of stood for stuff. And you would never actually have listened if it wasn't in the context of this. This is what separates what Neil is doing from so much other stuff. Like, it's a joke, yes, but it's also kind of not a joke in a certain way. Like, he's made genuine music out of music lost to time, and whether in the ironic tradition of making us think a little bit too long about what Ray Parker Jr. meant when he said, Bustin' makes me feel good, or demonstrating how ridiculous the song Bodies is when juxtaposed with, like, the goofy synth of popcorn. <laughs> His music is shockingly connective for just being mashups, but that's the core of the whole thing. It's connective. It's the least elitist thing on the planet because while it's making jokes about pop culture, it doesn't hate pop culture. It's not looking down on any of this. It's actually thinking about it and making us think about it in like new profound ways. It's less the inherent fun creation of memes uh, as it is an interrogation of mimetics themselves and what meaning is gained or lost in their creation, but it's genuinely the fun of memes, which is placating a desire from a work that maybe wasn't there. It's a joke on an actual conversation one could have about music, and by listening to these albums, you're inadvertently engaging in a real conversation about culture with Neil Ciceriga. Someone who is genuinely funny in a loving and unhateful way, but is also making very thoughtful commentary in a very easy to engage with way. His music has brought the internet culture together around something that we all just kind of joke about, and it's the opposite of the natural progression of music to these like weird subcultures. It's music for everyone that's also commenting about the last time that music was for everyone. And to only briefly talk about all the things that Neil has done in his career as an internet person, he always finds ways to do exactly this, to make stuff about pop culture that comments about pop culture, but in a way that's loving, fun, and thoughtful. In a world where so much music that I like lives for a little while on my iPod but eventually finds its way to obscurity, these three free albums of music that, you know, I probably would have called annoying when I was a snarky, douchey 16 year old continue to be in my listening arsenal. And every time I feel like I've deconstructed them unnecessarily for the final time, I have just one more thought. Hey, uh, thank you for watching this. Uh, this is just kind of a brief little thing about Neil Ciceriga. Yeah, I don't know. I was having thoughts about about like, I want to talk more about like general pop culture stuff. I'm kind of bored of talking about movies. I think a lot of people are. So I kind of want to expand my horizons and talk more about other stuff. But I was thinking about, you know, the diversification of music lately. And I was like, hey, I should make a video about that. How do I make a video about that? Neil Ciceriga. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I'll be seeing you around very soon. Also, behind me, this place is going bye-bye. I'm moving in like a week. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be gone and we're gonna be in a new place and I'm gonna have to reset all this stuff up. Uh, so it might be a little while before the next upload, but uh, at least the stress of trying to do this will be over and I cannot wait for that to happen. Uh, but anyway, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!